Good afternoon, this is Sean Golding with Golding and Golding here to discuss a common issue we see often, uh, non-residents who want to invest in U.S. property, whether it's because they inherited some money or they just want to expand their portfolio into the United States. Investing in the United States is a great opportunity. Some of the nice things about investing in the United States versus other countries, one, you do not need to be a U.S. citizen or even a resident. Some countries uh, limit the ability to acquire property, real property, in that country to people who are considered citizens or residents, so not anyone can invest. Uh, some types of investments could be uh, purchasing one or multiple rental properties, investing in a RIT, or a joint venture, such as, for example, maybe a couple people come together to acquire the property. Tax planning for acquiring real estate should be done at that time or before, not after, because once a non-resident owns U.S. property, the rules change and the tax implications can be brutal. Let's go through some of the common tax scenarios. If you are a non-resident alien and you are renting a U.S. home, the renter is supposed to withhold 30% and provide it to the IRS. Obviously, in real life, this doesn't really happen, but they're supposed to. It's FDAP, Fixed Determined Annual Periodic Income. Now, you can make an election for it to be treated as ECI instead, which is Effectively Connected Income, and then you get to take all your wonderful deductions, depreciation, commissions, legal, marketing, all that good stuff. If you're a non-resident alien and you own a U.S. property, when you sell it, you're subject to FERPTA, the Foreign Investment in Real Property Tax Act, which means that the United States is going to withhold a certain amount of money from the sale price, not the gain. Normally 15%, so you sell a home for a million bucks, maybe you bought it for... I don't know, $950,000, not, not a huge gain, but nice, right? They withhold 150000 because that was the sell price. It's absurd, but it's to make sure that non-resident aliens pay tax, capital gain tax on the sell. Why? Because oftentimes capital gains associated for non-resident aliens is not taxable. Unfortunately, real estate doesn't fall into that exception. There are p potential withholdings, uh, exceptions to the withholding, but Something to keep in mind is obviously you want the deal to go through. The IRS doesn't move at the speed of light, and so uh, oftentimes FERPTA may not be feasible, even if it would be beneficial. Estate tax is a whole nother ball of wax, but something to keep in mind. When a U.S. person owns property, typically the exclusion amount before any estate tax implications kick in is $12 million plus for non-resident aliens. It's $60,000. You know, domicile rules will take effect as well, but for the most part, the general rules is a non resident only gets $60,000, which is not going to take you very far. After that, there are significant tax implications. So, a few tax planning ideas to keep in mind. When it comes to selling property, you want to be aware of FERPTA. When it comes to FERPTA, another thing to keep in mind, and just non residents um, investing in US property in general is that the IRS has a specific compliance initiative for you, right? So the IRS, um, LB&I, has various different compliance initiatives, FATCA, OVDP, Puerto Rico Act 60, and uh, non-residents investing in the United States is one of them, which means you want to try to stay away from that matrix. If the IRS thinks that you have a liability, you haven't been paying, there are various things they could do. While, of course, they can't do a passport revocation because... Presumably, you don't have a U.S. passport as you're a non-resident alien. They could put a lien, a levy, or possibly seize the property. If you're out of compliance for prior years, uh, you're just learning about this, there's various programs you can consider to get into compliance. There's VDP, the Voluntary Disclosure Program for people who are willful or just can't certify under penalty of perjury that they're non-willful. When someone's non-willful, they have a, a lot more um, opportunities to get into compliance that have the streamlined procedures, delinquency procedures, and reasonable cause. Uh, some of them offer a uh, penalty waiver. We have a lot of free information on our main website and our sub websites. You can always reach out and schedule a reduced fee initial consultation if you think it's appropriate and it's something that we handle here. Again, my name is Sean Golding with Golding and Golding. Thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of the day.